One of the questions that we've been mentioning a little bit in the uh, Fishers of Men's class is, is Jesus God? And I think that is a very interesting question um, because there aren't a lot of places in the Bible uh, that state it very, very clearly. However, we're going to look at one place that does state that very clearly today. And we want to really think about the question, who is Jesus? Does the Bible really teach the idea of the Trinity? Um, and how is Jesus different from God? And how is he the same? And can you just really say Jesus is God and worship him as God? I'd like to really look into that question and just look at John 1.1 1, 1 this morning. I'm kind of excited about uh, this this sermon and this search for truth that we can go on together this morning because all of it is just going to come from John 1.1 1, 1 and maybe a few other verses that tie into John 1.1 1, 1 because there is so much there in just a few words if we really begin to dig into it. First of all, we should establish that the Word refers to Jesus. Because if you notice here, the passage mentions the Word. It doesn't actually say Jesus. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So how do we know that the Word refers to Jesus? Well, also in John chapter 1, so in the same passage and in the same context, in the 14th verse of John chapter 1, John says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. So the bullet points were added by me, but no words were added or, or taken away from that verse. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Well, these things clearly describe Jesus. Jesus became flesh. Philippians 2, 6, and 7 says, Although he existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. So he existed in the form of God, which sounds like this spiritual existence and then he was made in the likeness of men. He became flesh like one of us. Jesus also dwelt among us. Matthew 9, 35 and 36 says, Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of sickness or every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. We know that Jesus traveled around among us. He stayed in people's houses. He preached wherever a crowd would come. He healed us. He felt compassion for us. He became flesh and he dwelt among us. And we know that Jesus is referred to as the only begotten Son of God. As John said, he had the glory as of the only begotten from the Father full of grace and truth. Just one example would be John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So He's referred to as the only begotten Son. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Greek this morning, which I know is unusual for us, and that's because it's not uh, good to bring up Greek all the time. You might scare people away, but every once in a while... It uh, might be good to look at this and look at the original language and what it means. So the word in Greek, you'll see there is monogonase. It's over on the, on the right after the equal sign. And it comes from two words that are put together, monos and genos. So monos is like one, you know, like a monorail is a train with one rail. Uh, monocle is like eyeglasses, but there's only one glass there. Uh, monos means only one. And genos you might notice it sounds kind of like genus, the uh, scientific word for a kind of animal or a family of animal. Or you might think of a genealogy being your family tree. Genos means a family or a kind. So monogonos would mean the only one of the family or of the kind. What it says when it says he's the only begotten son is that he's the only one of his kind. 
And that makes sense from a biblical standpoint because uh, even Paul said when he was uh, preaching on Mars Hill that we are all God's offspring. So there's some sense in which we are children of God. But there is an entirely different way and special way in which Jesus is the Son of God. It's as if saying, Jesus is God's Son, but in a way that makes Him the only one of His kind. Not the same way that we are children of God. He is the uniquely begotten Son of God, the special Son of God that is different, in a different category of His own. So, we can conclude that Jesus is the Word in John 1. Because Jesus became flesh, Jesus dwelt among us, Jesus is described as the only begotten of the Father, the only one of his kind, uh, which is how John refers to the Word in John chapter 1. The Word refers to Jesus. So here we are looking at this one verse. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So let's break it down into these three lines and look at them one at a time. First of all, in the beginning was the Word. That might sound a lot like something else that you've heard in the Bible. Because in Genesis 1.1, we read, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Um, And it should not be seen as a coincidence that these two books start off with the words, In the beginning. Because John knew about the Old Testament. He knew about Genesis, and he was, it would seem, making a reference to Genesis 1-1 when he said, in the beginning was the Word, especially as he then later says, the Word was God. And Genesis 1-1 seems to say, in the beginning was God. And if you look at Genesis 1-1 and this uh, Jewish literature, which John had inherited, which he was referring to, and you look at the first sentence of the whole Bible, uh, you'll notice that the word created here separates God from the heavens and the earth. And God is in the beginning, and then God, who's in the beginning, creates these things, the heavens and the earth. So God is eternal, and the heavens and the earth uh, were made in a point in time. Thus, really, if you look at what Genesis 1.1 is saying, by in the beginning, God, it's saying God is eternal, And then this eternal God created these things. And the word created separates the creator from the creature. So by placing Jesus in the beginning with God, by saying in the beginning was the word, John's placing Jesus before the word created in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God was there. The word was there. They are not created beings They are the Creator. They are eternal. So here's sort of the logic that you would follow there. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word refers to Jesus. Also, in the beginning God created, and that act of creation separates the eternal things from the things which had a beginning. Therefore, Jesus existed before creation, and He has no beginning. Jesus is eternal. That's the first thing you notice from John 1.1 is that Jesus is eternal. Just as in Genesis 1.1, when we read, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, we understand it to mean that God is eternal. When we open up the New Testament and read the first verse of John, in the beginning was the Word, we understand Him to be telling us that Jesus is eternal. And God suggested this about Himself, that He was eternal, even in the name that He gave for Himself. In Exodus 3.14, God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And you may know that I am is uh, the verb that God gave as his proper name, which in English we write out as Y-H-W-H. We don't really know how it's pronounced um, because the Jews never pronounced it out of respect for God. Um, but some people guessed that it was pronounced Yahweh, um, which, which is probably accurate. This is God's name, and it means I am. It's the verb to be. And it carries the very essence of eternal being. When, when Moses asks God, what should I call you? And God says to Moses, 
I am who I am. I just am the one who exists. Um, many, the, the Jews and many people after have understood God to be saying that He is the eternal ground of existence. He's just the one that's always existed. There's no other way to, to wrap your mind around it or to try to wrap your mind around it. And that's why He gave that name, I am, as His proper name. So it shouldn't surprise us then that Jesus suggested that he shares in that eternality in John 8, 57 through 59. So the Jews said to him, You are not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Therefore they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. You know, Jesus could have said, before Abraham was born, I was, if he wanted to. But he chose to say, before Abraham was born, I am. Surely he did this because he was identifying himself with God's proper name, which, which showed us God's eternality. Jesus identified himself using the literal meaning of God's formal name, indicating that he shared in God's unique eternality. It was a very bold claim that he made in saying, I am, and that's why they picked up stones to throw at him. Uh, they recognized the claim to deity that Jesus was making. Something else you notice throughout this passage, and it comes up first in the first verse, is that Jesus is referred to as the Word. Do you ever wonder why John decided to refer to Jesus as the Word? There may be more than one reason, but it's important to know that the word, word, in the Greek had a lot of, of connotations that came with it uh, that don't necessarily come with it in English. Uh, when I hear the English word, word, uh, not a lot of connotations come with that for me. But in the Greek, the word is logos. So you see at the top, uh, the top line here is actually written in Greek. The second line is sounded out in English. So the first line, which says, in the beginning was the word, in Greek it says, in arche, ein ha logos. And you'll notice arche kind of sounds like archaic, which would be something that was really, really old, or archaeology would be the study of really old things. Um, and arche means really, really old in Greek because it actually means the beginning. Um, so in these archaic times, before there was anything else, there was the word, but the word given is the logos. Now I just want to show you some of the things that logos might have meant to the people who heard John. Um, here's these different classes of philosophers that were around, many of them um, before Jesus was on the earth. The sophists said that logos meant discourse. And discourse is sort of like I'm talking to you right now. I'm trying to make a point. I'm trying to use logic. There's another word that comes from logos. And I'm trying to prove something and demonstrate that it's true. Use evidence and reason with you. Uh, that was one, one meaning of logos that these people had. Aristotle was a, a famous guy for thinking all kinds of philosophical things. He also said that logos was reasoned discourse and making an argument. But then, and this is still, uh, a lot of this is before Jesus even came to the earth, uh, the Stoics said that the Logos was the divine animating principle pervading the universe. They understood Logos to be something that was everywhere, all the time, that made the universe tick, that held the universe together, that made it work. And then Neoplatonism, which came out of that, said that the Logos was the generative principle of the universe. So basically the thing that creates and sustains the universe. Now the reason I bring all of this up uh, is not because I believe we should get all of our truth from worldly philosophies, but it shows you the way the word logos was being used in the time that John wrote John 1.1. 1, 1. Uh, all of us inherit some of our language from our culture, and we use words and other people know what they mean because uh, we use words in the same ways. And these are the ways that Logos was being used when John used it. And so for John to say, in the beginning was the Logos, and to say that Jesus was the Logos, 
was to suggest that he was, for instance, the divine animating principle pervading the universe. Sounds a lot like God. That he was the generative principle of the universe. That he was a, a creator and a sustainer. I believe uh, that that's what John was getting at. So there's this guy named Heraclitus, uh, 500 BC or so. He said, all things come to be in accordance with this Logos. Or around the time of Jesus, Philo of Alexandria said, the Logos of the living God is the bond of everything, holding all things together and binding all the parts and prevents them from being dissolved and separated. So maybe you can see why I think it might be important to look at what Logos meant to them, because it means a lot more than what word means to us. You know, when we walk around in English talking about a word, we don't think about something that creates and sustains the universe and holds it together and animates everything that happens. Uh, but those are some of the thoughts associated with Logos that, that maybe John wanted to suggest. I believe he was suggesting that Jesus holds everything together. And the Bible makes it clear that this is true in Colossians 1, 15 through 17. It says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by Him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. Isn't it thought-provoking and interesting to say that in Jesus all things hold together? And that's exactly what a lot of people would have understood John to mean when he said that Jesus was the Word, because the Logos was this principle that held everything together, that made sense out of the universe, that made it work the way that it did. It was a very big idea. Uh, this is kind of just a picture of an atom, probably not what they really uh, look like, but it's a depiction of an atom that has these parts that are being held together by different forces. Uh, those who understood Logos in this way would have understood John to be saying, if they had known what an atom was, that Jesus even holds the atoms in our universe together, and that Jesus uh, holds this building together. He holds our bodies together. And isn't it beautiful to think, not only that Jesus holds the physical universe together, but that he came to create a bond between us and God that is spiritual, to hold us together to God. So that's the first line. In the beginning was the Word. Suggests that God was, or that Jesus was eternal, was in the beginning with God, and that he holds the universe together. Now the second line of John 1 1 here says, And the Word was with God. We'll focus on the word with. There's the Greek again, and you might recognize some of the words again. Halagos means the word, and theon at the end means God, just like theology is the study of God. But pros there is the word that means with. So I'd like to focus on what pros means here, that the word was with God. Well, I just looked at this resource called Helps Word Studies uh, to dissect the word pros. They said it indicates extension toward a goal with implied interaction or reciprocity, which would mean reciprocating or something where one person does something and then someone else responds. There's a back and forth going on, an interaction. They said with presumed contact and reaction, and they said it naturally suggests the cycle of initiation and response. Sort of like having a conversation. To say that Jesus was with God is to say he was having interactions with God. He was in contact with God, in conversation with God. Which shows us that Jesus had a relationship to God the Father. Which interestingly shows us that Jesus in some way is distinct from the Father. Uh, there's some kind of a meaningful distinction when you say God the Father or when you say Jesus Christ so that these two persons can have this relationship with each other and can interact with each other. And Jesus said in John 17, 
Father, the hour has come. So here he is interacting with God the Father. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. And it sounds like there's an equal relationship going on. One glorifies the other, and that one glorifies the other. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. Even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all, who, uh, that to all whom you have given him he may give eternal life. This is the eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. And then he says, Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. You notice in a lot of these passages we find more and more evidence that the word being there in the beginning means that he was eternal. He was with God before all of the created things. But what we focus on here is that he says he had glory with the Father before the world was. Jesus and God the Father have been glorifying each other and sharing in their glory for an eternity. There is a glory that they had together before the world was. And that makes the third line of John 1.1 1, 1 pretty interesting. Because when we said the word was with God, it made it seem like, well, then the word was a separate entity from God. Um, they shared something, but it, it seems like they weren't identical. And then you just have this verse that says, and the word was God. Here's the Greek again. There's only four words. Theos, like theology, means God. Ain means was. So it's a form of the verb to be. Just like I would say, I am Alan. That's another form of to be. So God was halagos, the word. But you'll notice something that's a little bit different than you might have been expecting. That is that the word for God comes first in the sentence. It sounds like it says, God was the Word. Uh, and there's an important reason for that. In Greek, word order is used for emphasis, but it's not used the same way it is in English. We figure out what the subject of the sentence is by looking at the words that come first, normally. Uh, but that's not the way it is in Greek. Uh, and I'm going to explain this sentence some more. But it has been called one of the most elegantly cursed or terse theological statements one could find. That is, it says so much with so few words. Well, in Greek, the way you can tell what the subject of the sentence is, is the way that the word ends. So, theos means God as the subject of a sentence. Theon would mean God in a different part of the sentence. Or theoi or theou, those are different functions in the sentence like the direct object, for instance. Um, so theos would seem to indicate that God is the subject of the sentence. However, this is a special kind of sentence because notice, logos ends in that os sound too. It's like they share the subject of the sentence together, and that word aim works like an equal sign. So that in this sentence, God is equated to the word. Um, and this is a kind of sentence that appears all throughout Greek literature. That's one of the beautiful things about the Bible being written in a real human language, is that you can look at all the other places that people have written in Greek, look at the kinds of grammar that they use, the way they use the words, and you can learn what the words mean and what the grammar means. And that's what we've done here, to find this special kind of sentence, where ain there, that form of to be, works like an equal sign, and the two words share the subject of the sentence together. Basically, what it's saying is, God is equated to, is the same as, the Word. But, we know Jesus is the subject of the sentence, because Jesus has that little word, ha, the O there, which is the word the in English. And all through Greek literature, you see this. When the is with one of the words, that one is the true subject of the sentence. However, because the word for God comes first in the sentence, it is being emphasized. So, a translation of this sentence that really carries out the meaning, what a Greek person would have heard is, what God was, the word was. 
God comes first to let you know we're talking about God too. And God and the Word are equated to each other. Um, and the reason why the Word was God appears in all of our Bibles, and the Word is the subject, is because it has the word the there. Um, if John had wanted to say Jesus was a God that was like God the Father, but a different God from God the Father, he could have said that more clearly and in a different way than this. What he really said was, what God was, the Word was. So there's no uh, misunderstanding what he's trying to convey with the Greek. Jesus is God incarnate. Jesus came to earth, and what God was, Jesus was. Um, this may be an imperfect example, but one way to emphasize it is let's imagine that I had a red wagon, uh, and I wanted to emphasize the fact that the, the wagon was red, and I said, red is the wagon. We would understand that in English because we know red is an adjective, so we know the wagon is the subject. Um, red is the wagon. And in Greek, it says, God is the Word. The Word is the same as God. One final thing we can draw out of John 1.1. 1, 1. It says the Word was with God, which made us say he's somehow distinct. And then it just turned around and said the Word was God and equated God um, with the Word. And that's the fact that Jesus defies logic. A lot of people have tried to describe the Trinity in a way that makes perfect sense, but I'm not sure it can be done because there's something about the Trinity that defies logic. There are three and yet there is only one. That's the way the Bible teaches it and that's the way we've got to have it. He is distinct from God, but He is God. But, before people get too um, upset about Jesus defying logic, um, from a scientific perspective, from this perspective that says, well, everything has to make sense or I won't believe it. You know, I only believe things that, that uh, go according to logic. Then none of these, you know, scientific people with, with PhDs can believe hardly anything because um, science itself defies logic is what we're finding the more we study it. Uh, there's this, uh, one of the best physicists of all time, named Richard Feynman, he said, quantum mechanics describes nature as absurd from the point of view of common sense, and yet it fully agrees with experiment. So I hope you can accept nature as she is, absurd. Uh, and that's something that basically any scientist out there that you went and found who had you know, a PhD in, in some higher science would agree with you. They would tell you, for instance, that light is both a particle and a wave, um, even though those are two different things and you can't be both of them at the same time. Uh, they would tell you things like, well, molecules exhibit a bunch of different resonance structures at once, and yet they only exhibit one, and yet they don't exhibit any one at any given point in time. Well, it doesn't make any sense, but it also seems to match up with their experiments. Um, there are a lot of scientific experiments that defy logic, and maybe that's pointing us to God as well. Maybe God has created a world that we can't entirely wrap our minds around that isn't always going to make complete sense to us. And maybe that's when we learn to have faith and to trust Him beyond what we can see. So here we are in John 1.1, 1, 1, just to review everything that we've said. In the beginning was the Word means that, God, or that Jesus is eternal. The fact that He's the Word suggests, and it is confirmed by other scriptures, that He holds the universe together. And as I've suggested, that would seem to mean things physical and things spiritual. And the Word was with God tells us that He's distinct from God in some sense and has a relationship with God the Father and shares glory with God. And then, and the Word was God equates Jesus with God, says that Jesus is God. And yes, it does supersede logic. Uh, it goes beyond anything that we can wrap our minds around. All of that just out of John chapter 1, verse 1. Um, that may be important for some of us because we may have doubts about whether Jesus really is God. And what does that really mean? And hopefully digging into the verse and looking at all that context can help us unwrap that and start to understand it um, for ourselves. 
It's also important for all of us to realize what a big deal Jesus is because you see his humanity displayed when you read through the Gospels and you forget we're talking about a being that's eternal, holds the universe together, is distinct from God yet equal to God, shares glory with God, supersedes logic. We're talking about God and we're talking about something that's huge and it's easy to forget that when you just read about him you know, walking from one village to the next or whatever it is that he was doing that day. And that brings us to the final verse I want to look at this morning in John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, his one-of-a-kind son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. The one who came to the earth and who died for us, the Bible says he was God. The Bible says that he was eternal, that he holds all things together. And I believe that he died on the cross so that he could hold us together and hold us to God for an eternity. What an amazing thing to think that instead of just uh, continuing to sacrifice animals, which are these created beings um, God sent his son, his son who we are told is God, his son who in some sense was himself, to ultimately pay the price for us. Why he would want to do that, it must not be anything that's in us. He may have wanted to do that simply because of who he was and the love that is a very part of his nature. Jesus sent his son to die and we all have an invitation to die with him. If you would like to die with Christ in the waters of baptism, as it is described in Romans chapter 6, if we can help you in any other way, if we can pray for you or anything that we can do, you can come forward as we stand and sing together this morning.